Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. We're going to read verses 16 through 25. We have spent the last three Sundays focusing on John 10 and Jesus being the good shepherd and all of that, what all that means uh, for believers in Jesus Christ and all that the shepherd is and what the shepherd does for us. This morning I'd like for us to focus on the sheep, on the sheep which would be God's people. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, what is the purpose of the sheep? What is the purpose of the sheep? So what we're really asking is, what is my purpose in life as God has called me to be one of his sheep? And in Matthew chapter 10, we have Jesus <clears throat> gathering the 12 together and calling them out by name and ordaining them to be apostles. And in the first part of chapter 10, he sends them out as apostles and he gives them instructions on what they are to do when they go into certain villages. And that's in about the first 15 verses. Then, beginning in verse 16 through 25, he tells them of what they're going to be facing as they go into these villages. So in our purpose in following Christ, we need to look at this passage this morning and find out what did Jesus say that we need to be and to do in facing the issues that are at us this day? This nation is badly divided. There's ungodliness everywhere we turn. Uh, the leadership we have politically is so divided, no one can get anything done. So what do you and I do? As we talk to neighbors and friends and family, what do we do? As we talk to people about Christ, how, how do we deal with this? We're going to see this in Matthew chapter 10 verses 16 through 25. Shall we pray before we study? Father in heaven, we love you because you have first loved us and you've demonstrated that love by sending your only begotten son into the world to die for our sin and to raise him from the dead that through faith in him alone, believing he is your son, he did indeed die for our sin. He did indeed was raised from the dead and if we confess that he is your son and that we are sinners and repent of our sin and ask for forgiveness, we will be saved. And once we become believers in Jesus Christ, we face a world that is openly hostile to those of us who believe. And so, Father, as we come to study your word this morning, instruct us by your Holy Spirit as how to face that world and how to live in this world that is so hostile to you and your followers. May your children be spiritually refreshed and renewed and encouraged. May those here this morning who do not know Christ come to know Jesus as their Savior. And this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand for the reading of God's holy word. Matthew 10, beginning in verse 16. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and, for, and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to the death, and the father his child and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. 
When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let's look at verse 10 as we look at what Jesus is doing and commissioning as he sends them out. He says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Uh, the word behold means to pay close attention to what I'm saying or what I'm about to say. He's giving a solemn warning here about what it's going to be like to face this world as a, as a follower of Christ. And then he says, I am sending you out. I am sending you out. There are two verbs to send out in Greek. And this verb is a special verb. It's apostello, where the name apostle comes from. So when Jesus is sending out these 12 disciples, he's already called them apostles in the first part of Matthew 10. Apostle is one <clears throat> who has committed his life to Christ, has been following Christ, has been there at the crucifixion and the resurrection. And by the way, there are no biblical apostles today. Because you don't meet the qualifications in Acts chapter 1. And so Jesus commissioned them as apostles to speak with his authority. And the verb form, apostolo, is just actually sending them out with that same authority. So he's sending them out with his authority to take the message of the gospel. Now look at the, the next one. In Matthew chapter 28, in verses 18 through 20, lest you and I think we do not have the right to do anything, we really do. In Matthew 28, 18, all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Jesus has total authority over everyone and everything in creation. And then he says, go. The word go there is an interesting word because it means go through life. It means as you and I go through our daily lives, we go through this life with the authority of Christ. That verb to go also means that you go with a mission, with a purpose, a defined, definite mission that you want to accomplish. We go on that mission every day. There's a purpose in our life every day. What is it? What is that mission given by the Lord Jesus Christ to each of us who follow him? It's to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. As a believer and a follower of Christ, our mission is to make disciples. Now, in the process of making disciples, that doesn't mean we can't force people to be a follower of Christ. We point them to Christ. We tell them about God's love and God's mercy and God's grace. We should all tell them that... God's judgment is upon them and they're condemned if they don't know Jesus as Savior. That's part of the gospel. You must know you're condemned without Christ. But then you also must know the forgiveness and the grace and the love and mercy of God for them in Christ. Please come to Christ as your Savior. That's what makes a disciple. They don't become our disciples. They become disciples of Jesus. They follow Jesus. And you and I, that's our mission in life. That's what we're supposed to be doing. It doesn't matter where we are or who we with. I have become so discouraged here in the last few years as I attend funerals. 
funerals I do not do, but I hear pastors up there talk about Christ, talk about God's love and God's mercy, but they never tell people how to become believers. And I'm sitting there just waiting for that brother to say, and here's what you do, and they don't say it. Then I have to fight the flesh. What are you doing? People thinking about eternity, they're thinking about their own death. And you don't say anything about eternal, eternal life and forgiveness in Christ. Keep that in mind that there are times in our lives when we're thinking about our own frailty, mortality. And take advantage of that opportunity to show them that they can have life in Christ. And so we have this opportunity day in and day out to just mention the name of Christ. But as Jesus says in this passage, there's going to be some people who hate you for doing that. They're not going to like you at all. But that shouldn't stop us for fulfilling the mission given to us by Jesus Christ to go and make disciples. So we're being sent by Jesus to make disciples. Now, in the context, and you know how strong I am on context. He's talking to the apostles here. But I want to point something out to you. You and I are living in the same world today that those apostles lived in back in the day of Christ. Spiritually speaking, it's just as hostile and hateful toward God as the people were in the days of the apostles. So spiritually, nothing has changed. Culturally, there's a lot of changes. Everybody rides instead of walks now. And you don't ride a donkey, you're in a car. So there are changes, yeah, but spiritually speaking, the hatred toward God is still just as strong today as it was in the day of Christ. So we're facing the same spiritual challenges day in and day out. And this is where this passage is helpful for us. Now, let's continue on as we look in verse 10, in verse 16. He says here, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Thanks, Lord. I really appreciate that. Y'all know sheep and wolves. The wolf is looking at the sheep as the next meal. I'm going to devour you. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to eat you. I'm going to do away with you. And Jesus is sending us into this world? Yes. But we go in his authority and his protection and his leading. And we should never forget that. So then he says, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. The verb to be there means to be in a condition, but the verb is not to be. The verb is to become. The verb is to become wise. And to become harmless as doves, which speaks of a maturing process. All of us at certain ages of life, instead of saying age, I choose to say maturity. Sounds better than age. But all of us are at different stages and seasons in life. And those seasons and stages that we've come through, God has taught us a lot about life. And we're to take that experience that God has given to us and use that experience as we approach people, as we talk to people about Jesus Christ. We know how to handle people who become hostile when maybe at first we didn't know how to do it. You're going to, become to, know, you're going to come to know Christ if he kills you. No, we're going to be wise. We're going to be loving and kind. We're not going to get in arguments and try to argue somebody into heaven. And so we become wise as the knowledge that God's given to us as we study scripture, as the experiences we have in life, and as the Spirit of God leads us as we interact with people. We do that a lot better 
today than we did 25, 30, 40 years or more ago. That's what it means to become wise. It's a process of becoming wise. We also become harmless as doves. We know how to treat people. We know how to respond to people. How to leave a taste in their mouth positive for the love of God, for the grace of God. Not to be angry at them because of their sin, but to have true compassion because they're blinded by it. You remember when Jesus saw the multitudes, what did he do? It never says he got angry. He had compassion. And so for us to fulfill our mission in life, we need compassion that that person is spiritually dead, spiritually blind, and we want to see them come to know Christ. Well, getting angry at them and yelling at them is not going to accomplish anything. And when they yell at us, what does Proverbs say? A soft answer turns away wrath. We should give a soft answer. Yeah, yeah, we're going to be verbally beaten. Who hasn't? But we don't want to have the reputation of being an angry Christian. And that's what Christianity has to come, overcome today is being angry. Yeah, we should be angry at sin. But we should have compassion on that, brother, on that man or that woman who's caught up in sin and want to see them delivered from it. So Jesus says here in verse 16, be wise as serpents and harmless as dove. And then he goes on and he describes these people all the way down through here. In 17 through 22, he talks about how difficult it's going to be in the persecutions. And look at verse 17. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to the... Uh, to the courts and flog you in their synagogues and will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witnesses before them and the Gentiles. And so this is what happens. Beware. It says be on guard. This, is, this could happen to you. In, in our day and age, our own government is becoming so hostile to Christianity, we don't know what to expect. And that doesn't mean we need to stay in bed all day and cover up. It means we need to get out and go do what God would have us to do. But at the same time, do not be immature and gullible that nothing's going to happen to me. It's a possibility. And we have to be very careful with that. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, when they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For, what are, for you are to say what will be given to you in that hour. Now, brothers and sisters, listen carefully. Some people take this verse out of context and use it for a reason not to study before you teach a Sunday school lesson. Well, let me just give you fair warning. If I hear of any of you doing that, I will find you and break both arms. I better never hear of you just standing up and teaching the scripture without prayer and study and preparation. Now, I got to confess that when God first called me to, to be a pastor, I thought, why do I have to go to school, man? I just get up and teach. I was stupid because I didn't know anything. I appreciate the torture. I mean the experience of seminary. And the continued study and preparation and what God has built into my life through experiences of life and study. He's made me a teacher. I surely didn't make myself. But in the context, when you're challenged by someone and you don't have time to prepare, you don't have time to study, all of a sudden you're face to face with an adversary first thing to do is run. No, don't do that. Calm down. Just be calm. And say, Lord, help me. Help me. And always remember two things. First, you've got the Holy Spirit living in you. 
You've got the power of God in you. You've got the wisdom of God in you because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. The second thing is you are students of the Word of God. You know the Scripture. Now, emotionally, I can understand the mind just kind of needing to settle down. But once you settle down, you, you become calm. Lord, give me what you want me to say. And you know what? He will do that. How many times have you all been in a situation like that? Maybe in conversation you're with a non-believer and they were asking you questions and you were able to quote scripture and you were able to tell them things that you didn't know you knew. That's the Spirit of God working in you. And so this is what this verse applies to is when you find yourself in that situation of what we call apologetics, where you're, you're given a reason for why you believe what you believe, the Spirit of the living God is going to give that to you. He will never let you down. He's always there. And you will be able to respond in an appropriate way. This is what we're prepared for. Now, look at verse 22. In verse 22, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. The one enduring is the way that sounds. It's a way it's uh, translated. It means the one who perseveres. It's our word for perseverance, who will stay the course regardless of the difficulty. You and I need to stay the course regardless of how difficult a situation we find ourselves in, we handle that for the best ability that God gives to you and me. Now, how am I going to do this? Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Paul, in writing to the believers at Ephesus in chapter 5 and verse 15 this is such an important passage of scripture verses 15 through 17 look carefully then how you walk not as unwise but as wise look carefully how you walk the word walk there means how you conduct your life. How you conduct your life. How am I conducting my life in every situation that I find myself in? By the way I'm treating the people or the person I'm interacting with. By the attitude I have while I'm in a situation. Is it going to be pleasing and honoring to God? Am I talking down to someone instead of talking to someone? We need to be on guard of how we do that because we are being a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ at that point. How am I handling? So he says, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Am I handling this in the knowledge that God's given to me from his word by his spirit and then am I applying that knowledge properly? In other words, am I practicing what I preach? Do I do what I know I should do? That's what it's all about. So am I being wise or unwise? Now look at verse 17. Therefore, do not be foolish. Do not be foolish. Foolishness means to have the knowledge but not use it. I know better. You know better. So why did I act like that? Why did I have an attitude like that? And when we do things like that, then the Holy Spirit comes in and says, Why are you doing that? You know better than that. Why were you so short? Why were you so angry? Why did you talk down to them? Why did you destroy them? Don't do that. That's being foolish and unwise. Be wise. 
Now look at um, the next part. <clears throat> Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Making the best use of the time. The verb to make best use could be also uh, translated redeeming the time. The word time there, uh, there are two Greek words for time, chronos and kairos. Chronos is a block of time. Let's say an hour. That's a chronos. A kairos is each event within that hour. The word kairos is used here. Redeeming the event that you are involved with in right now. Redeem it. Redeeming that event means I'm going to do my best to be the witness for Jesus that he would want me to be. That's what that means. That's redeeming the time. That's handling the situation in a manner that's pleasing and honoring to God. That's how we go in to situations or find ourselves in situations that are deteriorating spiritually. And you might be the only Christian in the, in the situation. Or they might be one or two other believers. Maybe you know that maybe somebody else in that meeting with you is a, is a believer as well. And maybe you're making eye contact like, what am I going to do now? So you pray. Lord, give me wisdom. Help me to speak wisely. Help me to handle this wisely. And it could be you might want to pray, keep the mouth of this donkey shut. Because sometimes it's better not to say anything instead of opening the mouth and regretting it later on. And there's nothing wrong with that. Because what we want to avoid is opening this and putting in that. But we redeem the time for Christ. Any and every situation we find ourselves in, we should redeem it for Christ. It's very important we do that. And that's our purpose. That's the God-given purpose for the sheep. Am I doing this? Am I acting wise and not foolish? Am I redeeming the time? Have I, I have learned in the past where I've really messed up. Am I taking what I learned and apply it here? It's really sad when God brings us through life and all these experiences. And here we are at age 170 and I haven't learned to apply it. And you wonder why I keep getting in the same trouble all the time. Maybe you're a real slow learner and God's still trying to teach you the same lesson. When I was in the first grade, how many of you remember the first grade? When I was in the first grade, we were having a spelling test. <laughs> I was sitting there and the teacher called out the word. I didn't know how to spell it, so I turned around and looked on the paper behind me. And I wrote it down. The teacher said, Richard, what are you doing? I don't know how to spell the word. I'm learning. Them. <laughs> well, she was very kind. She took me aside and said, Richard, you don't do that. You're supposed to learn that so you know how to spell the word. Well, guess what? The next spelling test, I knew how to spell. I didn't turn around and look on the paper. It was wrong to do that. It was cheating. I didn't know it. I thought I could just ask for help and I'd get it. But I learned. And that's the key thing in life is learning from the experiences that God gives us because that's the one of the purposes of those trials is to learn from it. So when we go through the next trial, 
we'll handle it a lot better and a lot differently and we will redeem the time. Brothers and sisters, that's just a few purposes of the sheep. There are a lot more in scripture as you well know. But this is what the Lord has laid on my heart for us today. Is that I know and you know your purpose. And by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to do my best and you do your best to fulfill that purpose. And that is to redeem that time, that event for Christ. And in that redemption of that event, you and I will be wise and not unwise. But you have to have Jesus Christ as your Savior. You can't do it in the flesh. You got to know the Lord. Trusting Him for your salvation in Him alone. And then once we trust in Him, then we have to walk with Him as He leads us by His Spirit. Now you know, and I know, our God-given purpose. Let's go do it. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we love you and thank you for your love to us. Thank you for the life that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ and how you bless us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you for the events in life that you lead us through every day. Some are just so fun and joyful and a pleasure to live through and some are right opposite. They're hard, they're difficult, they're trying. And we don't want to be in them. But you're using us to redeem that time for your honor. You're using us to be a light for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so help us to redeem the time that you've given to us. Father, you've spoken to each one of us in our hearts by your Holy Spirit from your word today. Empower us now by your spirit to go and lead our lives in redeeming that time and fulfilling the purpose in our lives that you've given to us. And this I ask in Jesus' name.